My name is Gary Golden. I'm a professional futurist based in Brooklyn, New York. The key dynamic for the future of work is uh, one that uh, integrates uh, creativity uh, around innovation uh, and collaboration. And, and those skills that, that you can derive from your arts experiences uh, will be very important for uh, teenagers to capture uh, and continue and carry forward uh, as they move into college and work. Uh, in the world of, of kind of arts and, and the creative class, we see the emergence of, of new types of jobs. Uh, again, 15 years ago, if a young teenager would have said to his mom, I want to become a gaming designer, the mother would have probably called up her friend and, and you know, cried. Uh, and now that young person is making six figures and living in Southern California and having a great life. Um, and uh, that's an example, that was a leading indicator. One of the jobs that we see emerging today is the user experience designer. This notion that uh, service innovation and experience design for products and services across all industries, whether it's health or music or transportation, is going to be led by individuals that have this artistic foundation. So the experience designer uh, of the future will likely come from uh, uh, communities that have a very strong arts uh, foundation. There is a lot of conversation these days about the, the value of combining left-right thinking and uh, I think that uh, it's very important just from a uh, kind of a personal health standpoint that we have a very balanced approach to how we see and act in the world um, using our different brains uh, and I think it's valuable from a workplace standpoint. Uh, one example that we see in the world today is, is the comparison between company cultures uh, and, and one, that, one that gets a lot of attention uh, is the engineering culture of Google uh, and the, uh, the potential limitations that exist within that engineering culture of creating very compelling user experiences and really bringing creativity uh, and artistic flair to the process. So, uh, when we think about the future of, of, of young people and the, the, the left-right brain combination, I think we need to recognize that some individuals will always have a natural tendency to go one way or the other. But for arts educators, it will be important to find ways to uh, engage individuals that might have a dominant preference uh, with experiences that balance that out. So in the world of, of technology, there is the programmer uh, kind of archetype, the, the geek, the web developer. And out of this culture has come many wonderful things. It was the programmer culture that led to uh, social networks. It was the geeks that were the first people to become social online. Uh, it was also out of this community that created this notion of open source. So this idea of creating tools uh, and platforms for other individuals to use uh, uh, and create new uh, 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 tools and platforms. So that's a fantastic approach. Uh, the question we want to ask is what can arts educators borrow from that community? What can an arts educator learn from a programmer? Uh, how might arts educators create a set of open source tools that other arts educators uh, can use in the classroom? How might young people uh, use uh, platforms that are open to the public uh, to create new forms of art? So this, this notion that uh, uh, arts educators can learn from programmers and programmers can learn from arts educators uh, uh, you know, is a very important conversation to have. Teenagers that are interested in the arts and also interested in a, uh, a career path in the creative sector, so anything related from gaming to media uh, to communication advertising, uh, experience design, uh, they certainly want to start building a portfolio of their arts experiences that allows them to communicate to uh, uh, schools that they wish to attend, employers that they wish to work for, uh, and other uh, peers that they might partner with. So the, the building and the management of a publicly facing portfolio of their arts experiences is going to be critical. And what that requires is that young people learn how to appropriately manage their identity online uh, and know uh, that uh, E stands for evidence and that uh, their portfolio will, will be a reflection of, of their artistic ability and also their character. Young, young people have a natural, I think, uh, 
uh, openness to the world and that their, their default is uh, there will be no harm done by being transparent uh, and uh, teaching them how to uh, appropriately manage their identities and to, to have a, a, a higher sense of what you should not say publicly ever <laughs> uh, is a skill set and a mindset uh, for the future. There are two types of portfolios. There's a portfolio that you keep that you would use in a, a more formal interview application setting, uh, and then there is the portfolio that is public facing. Amongst young people, we, we see this uh, desire to be discovered, and it's important that public facing portfolios uh, have some sort of uh, organized and, and connective tissue that brings people back uh, to the broader uh, uh, work that they've done in the past. One of the uh, uh, issues that continues to uh, get more attention uh, is this uh, intersection of, of social networks uh, and online learning uh, and privacy. So uh, we need to continue uh, having conversations about the appropriate level of transparency and accountability in our online lives. So for young people moving forward, they need to recognize that more of their life will be captured online. And there will always be a risk that aspects of their lives uh, uh, will become public, even though they wish them to be private. But I think our expectations need to be balanced. Uh, the tools for managing privacy, uh, the tools for managing uh, our, our social networks in a way that doesn't expose everything to everyone uh, are coming. And uh, I think our our best approach at looking at the future of privacy is one that's balanced. Uh, there is always risk for young people and teachers in having some sort of uh, moment where uh, a privacy event happens, uh, but we need to expect that tools for managing more precise social sharing are coming into the world. So I, I had a wonderful experience uh, a few months ago. I was visiting uh, uh, extended family relatives and uh, the, the uh, son brought me up into his room and said, look at this, look at this. And he, he had uh, uh, hacked up a recording studio. So he had built his own microphone. He took pantyhose and wires and created a sound screen for the microphone. And he had this hardware that he created out of you know, very cheap materials. And then he turned and he showed me uh, the computer and he started going through these websites and he said, this is where I get my free soundtracks. This is the tool that I use that's free for mixing the audio. And then he played me a tape and he sounded like Kanye West. And I realized that he had done this entire uh, project without any uh, direction from his parents or from uh, teachers at school. And I asked him where he learned about it and he said his friends. His friends had told him about the website with the sounds. His friends had told him about the tool for mixing the audio. So it's a combination of self-directed, passion-driven learning uh, and peers, face-to-face -face peers. After he, ex he showed me this, this you know, fully produced soundtrack and really kind of blew my mind, I said, have you ever looked at website development? And I was trying to build a bridge. So uh, we need to recognize that uh, you know, a, a young person that's very interested in, uh, you know, hip hop or some sort of sound recording and they want to be a music producer or a celebrity uh, uh, star, uh, that that could just simply be the platform for exposing them to other creative industry jobs. So the question we want to ask uh, ourselves today is, with young people uh, having access to tools that can create perfect songs that sound like you know, a million dollar production studio delivered it, or they can Photoshop perfect images of the world. Uh, is that still art? And how does that change how we teach them about the process, how we teach them about quality, about judgment? Uh, uh, I think it is, it is just how the world is. It is not good or bad. It's just the world that they're growing up in. So one, one way to look at uh, kind of the opportunity and constraints of, of these tools that can deliver kind of a perfect uh, output is that they are very process intensive. So the steps needed to go from, you know, recording your voice to a fully produced soundtrack are many. There are many steps in that process. 
uh, uh, and in most cases, uh, they learn about those processes on their own. If they have a question, they go onto YouTube and they type in the question. They go to a user discussion group and they figure out how to solve the problem. So the more we can integrate process into arts education, the better we'll be. That's what employers want. Uh, that's, that's what it means to be a truly self-directed learner. So arts educators might want to look at how they might change their, uh, their approach to teaching to be much more process intensive. Uh, and that could include digital tools. Digital tools uh, give great output, but they're very process and stage intensive. It'll be important for arts educators to communicate the value of critical thinking and creative thinking that arts experiences provide young people that will be relevant to them remaining relevant in the 21st century workforce.